Welcome to the Lakota Wisdom Series. This is the first of six episodes. And Joseph Marshall has been so generous to do these with me for six different episodes. Today, our topic is living two different American lives. And the reason I picked that topic is because obviously we both consider ourselves Americans and yet we have very, very different backgrounds. I love every time I get to interact with you, Joseph. It's such a pleasure and an honor. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank here. You. So we have space at the end. I'm gonna go over a couple um, housekeeping things and then I'm gonna ground you guys in the space. So the first thing is please make sure to stay muted. If you're very busy and things are happening, feel free to mute your video and um, but not yet. So just stay muted on your mics. At the end, the last 15 minutes, you'll have an opportunity to interact with Joseph. You can ask questions or share what has been impactful for you or a way that you're relating to the content. We're going to just kind of have a fluid conversation around this topic. And I have purposely invited each of you because I think that you are all just wonderful humans and you will add to the conversation and you all have very different American lives as well. I'm going to have you briefly introduce yourselves for about 30 seconds. But first, I just want you to take three deep breaths and be with us here in this sacred space. Welcome everybody. Just to give you a brief introduction, for those of you that don't know Joseph Marshall III, he is, he was born and raised on the Rosebud Reservation. He holds a PhD from the Reservation University, which he helped establish. He's a storyteller, a historian, an award-winning author of 10 books. I'm a firm admirer, as you can tell including The Lakota Way, The Journey of, and The Journey of Crazy Horse. He has some books coming out soon, which I know that he may or may not talk about as time goes on in our series. His first language is Lakota. He handcrafts primitive Lakota bows and arrows, and he's a specialist in wilderness survival. I've asked him to be with us so that we can be more connected to these old ways that so many Americans and so many humans are disconnected from. This topic is really near and dear to my heart. And I find that when we can connect with our ancestors and we can connect with old ways and old stories that bring us back to coming home to ourselves, coming home to nature, coming home to being in connection with everything that is, then our world can change. We spoke a couple weeks ago and Joseph told me about a, a um, research study that I didn't know about where 40% of Americans actually think indigenous cultures are extinct. I cannot believe that statistic and I want to do as much in my own realm as I can to change that. So I hope that we can do our part and our role and I thank you all for being here. Like I said, you've all been chosen specifically and by design because you're all people I love and admire and thank you for being here. So uh, in this order, I'd like you to just take 30 seconds to say who you are and what made you say yes in this order, Gary and Diane. My name is Gary Stanford. I uh, am honored to be here as well. Nice to meet you, Joseph, it's a pleasure. I am a long time uh, software engineer, um, a lifelong artist, musical theater artist, and uh, very recently an anti-racism and anti-oppression educator. Um, so taking a new, a new path and have been writing my own uh, art stories and looking to dive more into theater arts. Okay, nice to meet you. And I'm Diane Ramsey. 
and good afternoon. good afternoon. I have spent the last portion of my life, or I should say probably the last 15 years, really focusing on leadership opportunities for women and girls. I was the co-founder. I've spent um, the last 15 or so years really focused on women's leadership, but in the corporate world, I worked a lot in, um, in various roles supporting inclusion and diversity. Three years ago, I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And so now I have the privilege of living in a land where there are so many indigenous people and learning more about the culture and the beauty, as well as some of the injustices that we've done um, to our original Native Americans. And so it's been quite a journey for me. And so thank you, Christina. I am honored to be here today, and I'm so for looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Diane. So we're all in different places of the world or in different places of the US. I'm in upstate New York. Joseph is currently in South Dakota. Kitty is in Texas. Gary is in San Francisco, and Diane is in Santa Fe. So I picked the, the crew that we have today so that we can really touch on what it means to have different American lives in different corners of America and have very different backgrounds. So Joseph, what do you think of this topic? Uh, interesting, because uh, as you all probably know, to put it bluntly, Native people, Native people who were born uh, within what are now the exterior borders of the United States were literally forced to be Americans uh, in a way that we are talked about, in a way we are labeled. Um, you know, the term Native American is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, highly misleading. And it has to do with how we came to that designation American for all of us to begin with, because at some point, the two continents, which were new to Europeans, got the name America. It was way back in 1500, 1538, I think, when uh, a couple of uh, map makers wrote a book and named the two continents of North and South America after an Italian map maker named Amerigo Vespucci. Um, before that, for some reason, for whatever reason, just Brazil, just the country of what is now Brazil, was called America. I don't know why. But eventually, as time moved forward, then uh, the, the two continents became North and South America. And eventually, the term American was, was very specified to uh, those white people who were British. Before that, uh, people referred to us generally as all of us as Americans, but somehow felt the need to semantically segregate us. So that's sort of in a nutshell, something about the term American. Um, we are, as, as Native people, we are indigenous to a continent that many of us way back when called North America Turtle Island. I'm not sure what the South American natives called their continent, but we here in North America um, had the name Turtle Island because a story of creation was common to many, many tribes. Well, how many tribes there were here, we don't know for sure. Uh, white, anth white anthropologists and historians like to say around 500. Uh, but I think, in my opinion, it's somewhere between 500 and 2,000 different indigenous groups or tribes or nations. Uh, so we, don't, we didn't have a label for ourselves. Like today, it's common to be Canadian, Italian, and so forth. We were just here. We're, and most of the names we had for ourselves was, in some way or another, the people. 
But we need to fast forward a long way to 1934 or 1924 when the US Congress passed the American Indian Citizenship Act uh, and, and gave us, granted all, all of us indigenous people who were living within the territories and the exterior bond, borders of the United States, what was then the United States, as Americans, as citizens, and therefore we became known as Americans. Now, a lot of us don't agree with that. A lot of us, frankly, don't like it at all because we predate America by a long, long way. We predate the, the country of the United States. And we predate the idea of America and American by who knows, tens of thousands of years. So oh, as an example of how um, people reacted and, and, and from various parts of the world react to this. I was on a trip to Siberia in 1994 for so two weeks. Who have fought a and I, we were, my, my friend and I, a professor from another university, were followed on by print and, and, and uh, broadcast media while we were there, because we were there to give a talk on cross-cultural education. At the end of our visit, before in a couple of days before we left, one of the print reporters asked me a question that no one had asked before. It wasn't it wasn't an issue that I hadn't thought about, but it was a question no one had asked me before. She said, "Do you think of yourself first as a Lakota, or do you think of yourself first as an American?" And of course, my reply was, I think of myself first as a Lakota. I, right now, and I've never, never, ever considered myself Native American or American Indian. I've considered myself Lakota first, and legally, I'm a Lakota American. And, and a lot of my fellow Lakota people and a lot of other indigenous people feel the same way. Uh, recently, somebody asked me, uh, um, are you American? I said, no, I'm Lakota. And that confused the hell out of them because they were expecting, you know, sort of a patriotic response because a lot of us, you know, were in the military and so forth. But that leads us to the, to the sort of to the topic of your, uh, the title of your presentation about, you know, all of us living in different worlds as Americans. Um, I'm guessing, and I may be wrong, I'm guessing though that many of you didn't have, didn't have to go through the experience of having your culture and your history torn away from you. When I was in fourth grade here on Rosewood Reservation um, at an elementary school, I remember ha having a history book for one of my class, one of the classes, one of the subjects that were known in those days of South Dakota history. South Dakota history. Now, South Dakota has nine native reservations. And right now, our, po our population is about 100,000 out of 800,000 or so. So at the moment, we're a significant part of that population. Back when I was in fourth grade, that was not the case. But this history book had, for fourth graders, had about 120 some pages with text, of course, and photographs. But the total amount of space devoted to the history of natives in South Dakota was half a page and one photograph. A few years, several years later, after after uh, it was maybe like fifteen years ago, I was giving a talk <clears throat> in uh, at a university in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it was a course 
for South Dakota teachers to be recertified and the state, um, the state said that those recertification had to, had to be a course in native history and culture. And so that was that, what that class was about. And they had to take it for research. And after giving my presentation, I forget what topic I was talking about, but I opened the floor to questions. And eventually, a woman who I had noticed sitting in the second or third row, who didn't seem to be pleased pleased to be there, and was outwardly very angry with her by by you know, the way she sat, that her body posture and so forth, and the expressions on her face. She finally asked a question, and she said. Well, why don't we have white studies? You all have native studies, there's black studies. Why don't you, why don't we have white studies? And my reply to her was, ma'am, your whole educational system is white studies. And that's the way it is. So growing up native, that kind of a system worked really hard to take away our sense of our culture and our sense of identity. Um, I know these are hard stories to tell. They are for me, but they're a part of who I am. They're part of what I am because it's connected to my history as a Lakota person. My father, Joseph Senior, uh, who was part French, and believe it or not, had had sandy colored hair and blue eyes. And none of his children had blue eyes. One of his grandkids do, but none of us had blue eyes or sandy colored hair, except for maybe a couple of my sisters. When he was in eighth grade at the Rosebud boarding school, not just a few miles from where I am now. Of course, the rule was you don't speak Lakota on campus. That was an unequivocal non-negotiable, absolute rule. He got caught speaking Lakota. The first time they made him kneel on a two by four in front of the principal office for an entire afternoon. And if you don't think that's too harsh a punishment, then I, I invite you to try it. And to sit, kneel on a two by four for three hours. Because that's how long he had to kneel on a two by four just for speaking Lakota, just to remind him that that was a rule and that it was not okay to be Lakota. Well, guess what? The second time he got caught, they hung him up by his thumbs, his thumbs. Keep in mind, this is eighth grade boy. They hung him up by his thumbs from a, from a water pipe in the basement of that same building. They tied cords around his thumbs and made him tiptoe, stand in a tiptoe position for two hours. He had to stand on his tiptoes, almost like a ballerina, the whole time in order to keep from dislocating his thumbs. And those were mild punishments in that era from when boarding schools were first uh, brought among us in, in the early 1900s to the time that they were all more or less shut down um, in the late 1950s. There are a few boarding schools still, still operating, but hopefully they're not doing those kinds of things. But this is what for us meant, you know, living in two worlds. Of course, when we were at home, we could speak Lakota if our parents and our household, household did so. And it was almost a relief to be able to do that. It was almost a relief to be who we are. And keep in mind, some of these students, like my dad, he was fortunate. He would go home for holidays, an occasional weekend because his parents lived, you know, 20, 30 miles away from school. But in the beginning and still uh, up until the 1950s, some of those children, some of those Lakota children and other children from other tribes did not get to see their parents for the entire school year. From 
September to May. And those were shipped away to really far boarding schools like Carlisle Indian Industrial School or ones in Oklahoma or ones in California, sometimes didn't see their parents for years at a time. And this was all in an effort to one, assimilate us into what they thought was the better culture and to help us learn how to be Americans. So being American and having the label American always attached to us is a dubious thing. Now I'm not denigrating America. I'm not doing that. I'm talking truthfully about what the United States of America did to my kind of people. And, and, and in many cases, still is. Uh, a few years ago here in the state of South Dakota on one of the Eastern reservations, there was, and this still happens, is it an attempt at voter suppression. Um, and and it, 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 it prevented a lot of people from casting the ballots uh, in the general election. So, you know, this is, this is the way I grew up. This is the way I grew up. Um, being, being relegated to being a, a uh, second or third choice when, when two teams at, at the school chose up sides, I was always one of the last ones to be picked because they assumed I didn't know the game or I wasn't good enough or they just didn't want to pick me. Um, anytime there was any dispute between me and some other student, uh, I was nine times out of 10, I was the one who punished, who was punished, even though I may have been in the right, even though I may not have started, started the problem. So it's, it's somewhat easier, but I hesitate to say that, but it is somewhat easier uh, for, for my, it was somewhat easier for my, my children and my grandchildren, which I am grateful for because I don't want them to go through what I went through. I don't want them to go through what my parents went through and my grandparents went through. So when that later reporter in Siberia asked me, do you think of yourself first as, as a Lakota or do you think of yourself first as Americans? My answer came out in maybe two seconds. I'm a Lakota. Um, the first and foremost of Lakota, having to survive, having to get along in, in a culture that is coercive, uh, paternalistic, condescending, and racist. And there's racism right here on my home reservation. It's still here. It was here, it was here when I was a child. It was here in my formative years. It was, it was here when I went away and when I came back, I looked for signs that things had gotten better. But they haven't, they haven't at all. It's not, just, it's not just the glares we get from other people sometimes, it's in being denied housing. If we apply to rent a house and we're denied, but we're given all kinds of amalgamous reasons why we, our application was denied, but the real reason is that that landlord did not want to rent to a native, native person. So that's the first part of my answer to your question. Thank you, Joseph. And I have a little bit of a delay, so I apologize, you guys. I wanted to talk about this because it is a difficult conversation and it's difficult to see the things that we don't want to see as human beings and our education system has is an incomplete education and Joseph and I were talking about this before where the American education system was designed to build a workforce it was not designed to actually educate and right. 
we need to have these hard conversations of what the different cultures in America go through. And our biggest teachers are the ones that have been here for thousands and thousands of years. And that is the indigenous, that is the Lakota, that is the Iroquois, that is all of these native cultures that have this rich history that has been passed down generation to generation. And the beautiful thing when I speak with you is that I don't feel like I'm just talking to Joseph. I feel like I'm talking to many generations that have been here a long time. And what makes you so wise is that you don't think of yourself as wise. You just are in your being. And I am so honored every time I get to be in your presence because I learn more about being a better human being and understanding different cultures and understanding my own history and my own lineage. And I think we have become so disconnected from our lineage as one particular line and human beings as a whole society and as a whole species. We've been taught to think of ourselves as separate, especially in my own upbringing. It was very much, I grew up in the 80s when there was MTV and lots of commercialism and lots of separateness from nature, especially. And as it, and video games came up and computers came up that disconnected us more and money became more important and money before people. And every interaction I have had with someone who is very connected to their indigenous culture has a completely different viewpoint that we are nature. We are part of the system and you have to honor that or there's a breakdown. Right. Um, fortunately, and there's one characteristic that all humans have, but it's one that we indigenous people have had to really, really use and, 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 and bring up, bring out in ourselves, and that's resiliency. And because of resiliency, uh, a, a lot of our culture has, has been passed from one generation to the next not just language, not just dancing, not just costumes, but our culture, uh, depending on what they are. Now, uh, <clears throat> my, my take on this, this statement, the Native American culture is incorrect. I mean, that label is, that phrase is, is incorrect. If there were between 500 and 2,000 Native, different indigenous Native tribes in on Turtle Island, they were not all the same culture. They certainly didn't speak the same language. But when you talk about our connection with nature, you have to consider that it was upfront and personal and practical to be connected to nature because we lived in it. We not only had to survive in the environment, but we had to come to terms with it. We had to accept the, the limitations we had within a natural environment. And the natural environment was a basis for many, many, for all of our cultures, all the way from all the way from the Arctic, all the way down to Mesoamerica. And the deserts in between, the mountains, the forest lands on the east, and so forth. And that's all different. Different climates, different terrain, and differences in a lot of ways, and all those impacted how people lived, how people had to survive within those parameters of nature. But we did, we did. And so that is a basis for cultural wisdom, if you will. It's connected directly to how we had to learn to live with the environment, what our limitations were as two-legged people, alongside all the other creatures that were in that environment. When we as Lakota pray, and, and this is not a statement on religion, this is a statement on spirituality and connectedness. 
when we pray, we say, Father Sky, Mother Earth. Those are the first two directions that we pray to, up and down, Father Sky, the Earth. And then we look to the West, and then the North, and then the East, and then the South. And then our final appeal is to Dakush Kanshka Wakha. Not the great spirit, as a lot of people think that we say, it's not. Dakush Kanshka Wakha means all that is all that is all that moves and is sacred. In other words, the creative force that we all share, the creative force that all of us, no matter what our cultures, are part of, part of, whether we know it or not. That's our stance. So those, those are what we pray to when we, we, we pray. And most people do it every time they pray, to acknowledge the powers in our world, not our universe, but our world, our, our grandmother earth, our mother earth. Uh, and that's our spirituality is based on something that is real. It's not based on mythology. It's not based on anything else, but what is real, the reality of the natural environment around us. There is a, a west, there is a north, there is an east, there is a south, there is the sky, and there is the earth. Those are the realities of our existence. And we still do that. Maybe not as many of us do that, but we still do that. I still do that. Uh, I have a grandson, I have a, uh, not a grandson, but I have a nephew who is a medicine man. Uh, well, two of my great grandfathers were medicine men. Uh, my, my maternal grandmother's father was a medicine man. My maternal grandfather's second father or stepfather to you all. His second father was a medicine man. So medicine men are part of my heritage, not just generally speaking as a Lakota, but familiarly as well. And one of my nephews is a medicine man. He's a healer. I mean, that, and again, that's a common term that can be misleading. For us, uh, we call those people, we call them several things interpreters, so forth. But the common term is wapia wichasha or wapia wiyam. Wichasha is man, uh, wiya is woman. Wapia wichasha means the man who fixes. Wapia wiya means the, man, the woman who fixes. So we come to them with our situation with our dilemma, with our illness, with our whatever it is that we need to be fixed and they help us to fix it. They don't do it themselves. They call on spirits from the other side who are their helpers to come if they will and give us that assistance. It's not a matter of whether we're worthy of it or not. It's a matter that we ask humbly. And that's what a lot of the, our ceremony is about. We ask very humbly for that assistance, whatever it is. And, and uh, my my uh, nephew, who is now in his sixties, has been a medicine man for over thirty years. He did not want to be a medicine man. He was uh, another older medicine man. Probably saw that he would be called upon to walk that path, as it were. So he took him as a boy and brought him into ceremony, had him help set up a ceremony, had him help during the process of the ceremony and so forth, to get him familiar with what went on during the, the conduction, uh, conduct of a ceremony. So by the time he was a teenager, he knew the routine. And then, then he had a dream, but he resisted that dream. He said, no, I do not want to be a medicine man. And you know what, frankly, any medicine man or woman 
up here in our tribe, in our nation, does not want to be a medicine. It's a calling. It's a calling rather than a career choice. And every one of them will tell you, I wish I hadn't had that dream. I wish the old ones hadn't come to me and asked me to be this. Because of that calling, their lives are very difficult. Their lives are not easy. My nephew has had any number of illnesses because he's offered himself in place of his patients when it comes to physical, physical illnesses in order to help them. That's the kind of, kind, kind of commitment that our medicine men need to, men and women need to make in order to be what they are. Once they've decided that this is the path they should follow, then they're in it all the way. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy life. I've seen him uh, ill, Thank I've you seen him uh, despondent, and sometimes in doubt of the path that he chose. But, but that's, that's the path he chose, and he lives with it. And others of us don't have, you know, as tough a time with anything like that. But nonetheless, we still have to, even in this day and age, contend with uh, people who scoff at our spirituality, who, who, uh, who don't give credence to our beliefs, or the fact that we want to teach our history ourselves, and that we should teach our history in public schools the way white history is forced on our children and grandchildren's throats. Uh, that still goes on. But because we're resilient, we make it work somehow to the best of our ability. When that act was passed in 1924, the United States Congress, the United States government didn't ask us, do you all want to be American citizens? They didn't ask us at all. They just did it. I'm sure there were, there probably would have been some tribes, some tribal nations that would have said, okay, well, yeah, it's okay. But I, but I guarantee you that among others, there would have been a healthy debate because they perceived it as an attack on our sovereignty, our legal sovereignty. And a lot of, a lot of people still look at it that way today. So, you know, we are, uh, our elders advise us, you know, now there's no choice. We have to make the best of it. We have to live in this, in this environment. We have to live in this mainstream society that is in control. And like it or not, that's the case. You know, they, they pass the laws, they dole out the money, uh, so, so we have to make the best of what the tools, legal tools and, uh, and financial tools that we have to work with. But uh, thank God for resiliency. Thank you, Joseph. And I want to, before I open up the floor to our other guests, and because of my um, delay, I may need to switch devices. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm curious, just briefly before we, we give over the floor, what is, if you had the attention of Americans that were feeling disconnected and searching like myself and those of us here, what would you say to the, the delta between and the space that seems so vast between embracing spiritualism and embracing your calling for something versus this kind of American ideal of rugged individualism? Well, we're all, we can all be rugged individualists if we want. If that's your thing, go, go for it. But we, we as Lakota people, and, and the same is true for many other tribes, um, the very existence and functioning of our villages, our societies, and our nation uh, was based on us looking out for one another. 
we were, were, we were a socialistic society because we didn't have any money. We didn't have an economic system that was based on uh, any kind of value system like money or currency. Our, our primary purpose was to take care of one another. Um, and, and that's the one thing that we're all taught from the beginning. You take care of each other, you take care of your neighbor, you take care of your family first. Uh, and everybody else deserves that same kind of, same kind of, you know, consideration. Every culture at one time or another uh, has, has values that are common with a lot of other cultures. I, I wrote a book called The Cult Away and I talked about 12 values that were central to our Lakota culture. Humility, wisdom, compassion, love, honor, uh, generosity, courage, fortitude, wisdom, and probably a couple that I've forgotten. But they're not exclusive to us. Those kinds of values have been at the core of a lot of cultures throughout the world. And if you want to find your own way, if you want to find your own base, you want to find your own purpose, then examine what those values really were. Forget about capitalism for the moment. Uh, forget about the class system for a moment. Forget about wealth for a moment. And look at those values. Study those values and see how they were the strength and the core of a lot of cultures. Now, we as natives were overwhelmed by a culture that had higher numbers. They, we weren't defeated, quote unquote, defeated because we were a lesser culture or a lesser people. We were simply overwhelmed by numbers. In 1850, the population of the United States of America was 25 million, 25 million. The population of the Lakota at that same time was 25,000. So in terms of odds, we didn't stand a chance. They would have overwhelmed us sooner or later, just by numbers, not because we were weak, not because our cultures were weak, because we couldn't, we couldn't stand up to the odds. But those values go across many cultures. And, and they, they'll work even to, in this day and age. They still are, they still are, can be a functional part of any society. If we practice them, if we teach them to our children and grandchildren and demonstrate, lead by example on how to, how to be compassionate, how to be generous and so on and so forth. So that, that's what I would advise. Look at those kinds of values that have served many cultures throughout the world for a long time. I love that. And that, it, that is why we're here, right? Like we share those values and otherwise I don't think we would be in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I find that in, in my life, the, the last few years, especially what's really guided me is to be really take a stand for the things that are important to me and not fight against things, but take a stand for the values that you speak of and that everything else is just noise and it's really important to me to, um, I was telling someone earlier about this conversation coming up and how I was looking forward to it because I don't know where this is going for me, but I know that I want to highlight voices that haven't had a voice. I want to highlight the truth as painful as that may be. I want to have bigger conversations and bolder conversations that we really are willing to look at the fact that how maybe my experience has been has not been everyone's experience and vice versa. And I, in, in my background, I was raised around a lot of addiction and trauma and mental illness, and that hasn't been a lot of other people's experience. Right. So if, if they didn't experience that, they wouldn't know how to relate to that. And I think that that what we're speaking about here is something that is common in people that are silenced it, whether it's a person individually or an entire community and culture, mm -hmm. which is 
what happened there. And we're seeing it a lot in our race conversations right now. And um, yeah, so with that, I am going to turn it over to, we lost Diane because her, her phone overheated. <laughs> so, wah, wah. And I thank you for your guys' patience in me needing to pivot to a new device because my computer was overheating. Oh, oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> Which is why it kept being chunky. So oh, Apple, something I have to deal with. So we are here <laughs> and I appreciate you guys working with, going with the flow with that. Right. So you may unmute Gary and Kitty if you, um, whoever wants to go first. And the last, uh, we, we kind of went a little longer than, than I had intended, but it's, it's always such a pleasure to listen to you speak, Joseph. So thank you. So whatever questions either of you have or comments, how you want to relate, the floor is yours. Yeah, I guess I can kick it off. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing so much uh, rich culture and history. Um, I, I can definitely uh, just relate to this content in general because I've been spending the last year or so researching um, African-American culture and African culture just to try to connect to um, to my history a little bit more than than ever and uh, what I've actually found in mainstream education in this country is we kind of have a unique opening this year there's there's uh, there's an interest to learn about indigenous cultures and African cultures in mainstream education um, my question for you is what what is your thought in terms of how we might approach this from uh, from the, the native indigenous um, education and understanding and integrating that into American education. Well, um, we native people uh, took advantage of an opportunity took advantage of an opportunity fifty years ago uh, or so, and since that time. Uh, there are now about, there are about 38 or 39 uh, indigenous, indigenous colleges or universities on reservations throughout this country. There's one here on Rosebud called St. Igleska University. There's one in a neighboring reservation. In fact, every reservation on this continent has one or satellite camp campus. And we, we, Ironically, we're using the same instrument that was used to take our culture away from us to bring our culture back, formal education. Right. Only right. now we're in control. We offer, you know, we, as accredited colleges and universities, we still have to offer the usual courses of English, math, and science, and so forth accounting and all the other things. Right. But we also offer indig indigenous language, history, and culture. And we're, we're reconnecting people. And I'm not, I hesitate to, hesitate to say young people because a lot of the students are not young people, college age kids, mm -hmm. they're older adults. We're reconnecting our people with their heritage, with their language, with their culture. So that's how we're coaching. And I know that there are, there are black institutions that are doing the same thing. In fact, that's one of the models that we use, it, it, places like Howard University and Tuskegee and so forth. Um, we followed their pattern. Uh, as far as individual communities are concerned, uh, we turn to our elders who still knew a lot of history and culture. Some elders here still do. And they are a valuable, valuable resource. Don't ignore the elders. They will help you. They will share their knowledge with you. At least those of us who aren't crossing it will probably do that. Right. Um, that's, that's, those are the two of the ways that we, we've done it and we're doing it. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Alcoholism is is 
a painful reality here on the reservation. And now it's the drugs. But I bring up alcoholism because my father, Santa Herd Blue Eyed Lakota, was a soldier in World War II. And he came, finally came home in 1946. And I don't know how long he was drinking before that while he was in the service, but I do know that he drank from 1946 until 1986, 40 years. He gave his life to alcoholism. I, I never knew my father as a real man. I only saw him as a drunk man and what he can do when he was drunk. There were moments when he was sober, when I caught glimpses of him as the man he was. So given that life uh, childhood experience for me, I did my best not to give in to that illness. And I haven't because it was a hard lesson for me. It wasn't that I loved my, didn't love my father. I just saw what that did to him. And I saw the hard road he had to walk. And I'll tell you, quickly tell you an interesting story of why he quit. He had gone to treatment several times, but always fell back into drinking. In 1986, in the spring of 1986, he went on a weekend binge with a, a lot of other people. And they were sitting under a bridge like 30 miles from here. And it was early in the morning. They were out of booze, but he had one case of beer in the trunk of his car. So he went to get that, that case of beer. And as he was lifting that case of beer out of his trunk, he turned and at the fence line near where he was, it was a, a narrow gravel road. At the fence line, he says, he saw all of his grandchildren standing in a row. And at that time, I think he had like 16 grandchildren. He saw all of his grandchildren standing in a row, looking at him. He turned away and looked back and they were still there, looking at him with these imploring, pleading expressions on their face, faces. So he turned away from them, took, took the case of beer down to the guys under the bridge and said, here, you have it, I'm going home. And from that day on, he stopped drinking. And my mother talked about, and my mother was the one who told me the story, because he, he had told it to her. Um, he went to a hellacious month of, of uh, recovery. He was ill. It was almost like he had the bends. He was physically, so physically ill he couldn't eat. But at the end of it, he came out. He came out of it. He didn't drink from that moment. He died in 2001. And after he became sober, he ran for the tribal council and got elected to three terms. And I finally got to see the side of him that was I knew was always there as a man, as my dad. And so all of us have those kinds of experiences in the background. But you know what? As tough as they are, we also have the resiliency to keep going, to move ahead, to, to, to follow whatever path life has ordained for us. That's all we can do, and I like your cat. That is such a beautiful story in closing. And I want to appreciate you being with me in this, Joseph. And Thank you. Agreeing to do this with me. And in your last story, I, I realized that I think that's probably what drew me to you so much, it, even though I didn't know that about your father. My mother was mes methamphetamines. Mm. So mine was, I, I've done everything in my life to not take that path right. and, and to not have those behaviors associated with that path. Because sometimes you can have the behaviors from an addict or, or right. an alcoholic without exactly. ever taking a drink. Right. And so I, um, and I see you two nodding with that so you know where I'm coming from. So this has been a very rich conversation for me in many ways. And I appreciate 
Kitty and Gary for you both being here and joining us in the conversation, coming with your questions. I know how Gary's mind works and his mind's going with all the projects he wants to start for education. I can hear the wheels turning. And so you know where to find me if you have other questions or want to reach out about more of that stuff, just let me know. And Kitty, we have our ongoing conversation, so I'm sure we will discuss it more. Gary, we will resume soon. So <laughs> I will see you in a few weeks. And Joseph, we have a two week break and then I'll see you again for the rest of our sessions. I look okay. forward to bringing this out as much as possible. These will be posted on YouTube to encourage other people to reconnect with what is real and what is true and to keep going through hard things and to be a model for a better world, a different world. Absolutely. Thank Do you, you have any final it. words, Joseph? Nope. nope. Just, I'm glad to have visited with you all and, and uh, good luck. Thank you, everyone. Big love. Bye. Thank you.